what are some of the main parameters that impact uh, today's changing sea level? Well, there are really two main sources of uh, present-day sea level rise. Uh, the first of these, and uh, in many ways the most dramatic, is the impact on sea level rise that's associated with, uh, with the melting of large accumulations of land ice on the continents. Uh, in particular, the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, which are very, very well known to be melting uh, at an increasingly rapid rate. Uh, a second contribution uh, is that which comes from what we call the steric impact of the global warming process. As the water in the ocean warms up, the uh, volume of water in the ocean expands and this leads to a rise in sea level. Uh, but there's also a missing component which we still do not adequately understand, which is also associated with the loss of land ice uh, from what we call small ice sheets and glaciers. The total rate of sea level rise, which we're, we're observing with the altimetric satellites, is around three millimeters per year. Global sea level is rising as a consequence of the melting of ice from Antarctica at the rate of about three tenths of a millimeter per year, as compared to the six tenths of a millimeter per year, which is coming from Greenland. Mm -hmm. And remember, if we add these two contributions together, we get something less than one millimeter per year. The steric effect is contributing something like 0.5 or 0.6 uh, millimeters per year, most recently. And so we're missing about one and a half millimeters per year, which we're obliged to ascribe to the melting of this very large collection of small uh, ice sheets and glaciers. Modern tide gauge measured rates of relative sea level rise, uh, the impact on race measurements, the impact on altimetric satellite measurements, all of these data are very significantly contaminated by the influence of what we call glacial isostatic adjustment associated with the loss of the huge accumulations of land ice that existed uh, primarily in the northern hemisphere at the last maximum of ice age occurrence, which was around 20 to 25,000 years ago. It turns out that the shape of the earth is continuing to change as a consequence of the meltdown of the last of these massive glaciation events, which led to a rise of sea level of on average about 120 meters. The main change in shape is the change in shape from a shape which is more curling rock-like, more squashed at the poles, right, to a more spherical shape. And that squashed shape at the poles was actually produced by the large ice, ice loads that existed on the poles at last glacial maximum. So when these ice sheets were eliminated, the fluidity, if you like, viscoelasticity in physical terms, of the planet allows it to rebound slowly back towards a more spherical shape after the ice load on the poles has been has been removed. Because of these this particu these particular changes in the Earth's shape, um, we are able to actually monitor the ongoing changes in shape um, by using observations of the Earth's rotational state itself. And again, the theoretical models that have been developed to allow us to predict local changes in the Earth's shape through uh, relative sea level histories, uh, that same theory enables us to make predictions of what the changes in the Earth's rotational rate should be, uh, and those changes, those observed changes and that fit of those changes to the theory allows us to confirm what the internal viscosity of the planet must be and further confirm the close connection. Um, of the analyses of sea level history, planetary shape, sea level rise, to internal, much longer time scale, internal dynamical processes associated with plate tectonics. And it has been argued that three million years ago, sea levels were dramatically higher than they are at present. This is the so-called Pliocene warm period. The carbon dioxide load in the atmosphere was about equal to modern, that is around 400 parts per million by volume. It's been argued that sea level at that time was higher by 22 plus or minus 5 meters than it is at present. Right? Now it's known that at that time the Greenland ice sheet did not yet exist 3 million years ago. It formed after about 3 million years ago. But the Greenland ice sheet um, only uh, involves, in terms of eustatic sea level rise equivalent, about seven meters. If we were to add to the budget 
the loss of all of the ice from West Antarctica, right, at that time, that would give us perhaps another five and a half or six meters. Right? So there would still be a missing nine meters. Right? That would have had to come from East Antarctica. So think carefully about what this might mean. Um, it would mean that on a very long time scale, right, if we were to sit locked in the present day carbon dioxide concentration regime, and we were to wait long enough right, for the long time scale feedbacks to fully come into play, which involve the loss of land ice, right, then we would lose all of Greenland, we would lose all of West Antarctica, we would lose a big chunk of at least coastal East Antarctic ice. Again, mantle convection effects, plate tectonic effects, may have, may have contributed to these estimates of the amount by which sea level was higher during the warm Pliocene. One of the regions which has been most studied, uh, uh, especially by the American scientific community, um, is the region of Pine Island Glacier, you know, in West Antarctica, which is in this region of the Amundsen Sea Sector of Mary Birdland, which Grace observes to be losing mass uh, at the highest rate of anywhere over the uh, Antarctic continent. But in that case, the influence on the uh, destruction, if you like, of the Pine Island, Pine Island Glacier is not coming from warming above. Okay? It's actually coming from the impact of warm ocean water attacking the ice shelf that's connected to the glacier, right? And by destroying the ice shelf, eliminates the buttressing effect that it has on the rate at which the glacier can flow towards the sea. And so by eliminating this buttressing effect, the warming of the ice shelf from below by anomalously warm ocean water has led or is leading to continuing wastage of ice through Pine Island Bay. So this process whereby, or the processes whereby, land ice is lost to the sea, thus leading to a rise in sea level, are really rather complicated. Greenland can lose ice relative to gain by anomalously fast melting at the surface, what we call surface mass balance. But also because of melting during the melt season on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet, we can make melt water percolate down to the base of the ice sheet through what we call moulons, great uh, crevasses, if you like, in the ice. And once this water makes it to the base of the ice, it may, be, may so lubricate the base of the ice sheet right, that it's able to dynamically flow much more rapidly towards the sea than would normally be the case in the absence of that meltwater lubrication. So wherever you look and discover that um, land ice is being lost to the ocean, thus leading to a rise in sea level, there are a complexity, if you like, of processes which, which, are, which are contributing or maybe contributing.